our next speaker. Um, so next up we have Emil Reddy. Emil was the chair of, um, I want to get this title right, the MEC Diversity and Inclusion Steering Committee, which advised and led um, initiatives related to increasing inclusivity and celebrating diversity. Um, and Emil is now a diversity, equity, and inclusion consultant. And uh, yeah, just super excited to have this chat today. This is something that has been at the forefront of our minds um, at POW, just how we can really increase um, diversity, equity, and inclusion in our work and in our team and everything. So I hope that we um, are all excited to, to join this chat and I'm sure we'll learn a ton today. So Emil. I know you're on. I'm right here. Okay, it's awesome. All good. <laughs> there you are. Uh, hi, everybody. Okay. Uh, nice to see you all. There's a lot of uh, familiar faces. Ruben, Mario, uh, the team from uh, Arteric, MEC. Lovely to see you all. I'm sure there's many more people that I know on the call. Um, it's, uh, it's like kind of like coming home, talking to the outdoor industry um, since transitioning to doing this work. Um, kind of on my own and alongside really great organizations like the Corker Collective. Um, if you don't know about them, I definitely look them up. Uh, it's been a lot of uh, uh, really interesting connecting with organizations. I also wanted to thank Dave um, and Izzy for inviting me to this conversation. I think, you know, something that Dave mentioned um, around collective action is something that I think is really important when you think about um, who is the most affected by climate change and by um, and also needs the advocacy of climate action the most and it's usually folks that are at the margins of our society folks that are struggling with housing um, that are uh, racialized folks that are um, have a lower or different social economic status and different levels of privilege so you know as much as it seems like these things are separated they're absolutely connected so i really appreciate you all taking a moment um, through this Summit to have this conversation. Um, so before I get started, just like a couple things to front load. The, the talk that um, I'm going to be sharing with you all um, is that we are going to be putting you into breakout groups at one point, but that's just for a really uh, quick warm up exercise. You should have received um, something in uh, your emails, which is going to be an exercise that you will be doing with me. Um, and if you don't have that, no worries. You just need a piece of paper and um, a writing, you know, whether it's a pastel, a pen, a pencil, whatever it is, a, a charcoal, whatever it is that you want to work with, uh, as long as you have something to write with. Um, and the other is I would love to interact with you. So if there's like a question that you have, feel free to jump right in. It won't ruin my flow of facilitation. If it starts going off a little bit, I'll, I'll make sure to bring us back. Um, so it, without any further ado, I'm just going to start. Um, and that is really the way that I would love to start is uh, to acknowledge the land that I currently am on. You might have done this already at the beginning of your summit, um, but for myself, where I'm located is on the unceded and stolen uh, territories of the Squamish, Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Stolo nations. And for myself, when I think about that um, and my, my journey of reconciliation, it's really from the lens of being a trans person of color. So the way that I am walking into my reconciliation is to, to strive to be an allyship of my two-spirit sibling. So elevating voices of the two-spirit community and really trying to, to see how I can support that community. And I do that with working with um, a mentor in that space to see how I can do better. So I'm not making assumptions on what they need. Uh, I'm going to be sharing a, a presentation with you. So I'm gonna do that now so you'll see my face a little bit, but mostly see the presentation. But um, Izzy, if you could manage the chat, if there's any questions that come up, I would really appreciate it. Okay, so here I go. Oh, you're seeing Peanut. <laughs> That's my pooch. So always great to start with whose land you're on. If people are curious to know how to uh, find out whose land you're on, there's two ways that I would recommend. One is the Whose Land app. So you can download that from the App Store 
on your phone um, and uh, what, whichever app store you have, whether it's an Android or uh, the iTunes store. Uh, the other is the Who's Land uh, website, which, or sorry, the Native Land website, which is native-land.ca. And they actually um, have a fantastic image of Turtle Island or what we know as North America with all the intersections of the different nations. So two really great resources there. Okay, so where to start your justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion journey? Um, and for me, the spoiler here is that it starts with you. At the end of the day, this work starts with, uh, with you. It, and the reason why that's really important is recognizing where you come from. Uh, when I started this journey 12 years ago, I had to really, really figure that out as to who I was, what my perspective was, what I brought to this work, both from a professional and skill set experience, but also from a lived experience. Uh, and the reason why that's really important is because when you get to know who you are, you also get to know what your biases are. You bring what is unconscious to the light. A lot of conversations happen lately around unconscious bias. It's become a bit of a buzzword, similar to climate change. But there's the reason why both of these things are important is that you need to actually understand what they mean and the impact of them, both internally to yourself and externally to the people around you. So when you think about unconscious bias, what that really means to me, in my opinion, is the way that you interact, you see, and you perceive the world. And the way that you do that is going to be unconscious until you bring some of those pieces to the light, into your conscious. So you're like, Emil, this is all very like vague. What do you actually mean by that? What I mean is like actually figuring out what your lens is. So I did this um, journey and I did this uh, exercise, I guess, uh, with myself. And now I do that with, with other people and organizations is defining what your lens is. This is a bit of a disruption on what a bio would be because what it does is that it actually centers diversity of perspective and you actually, you actually bring to the light what your perspective is. And it is a, a little bit more telling than a regular bio would be. So my lens, as you see in front of you, is uh, really different aspects of who I am. The way that I came to this journey before I described to you my lens is I actually followed something called TMA. Um, so this is a book by a really amazing um, queer black woman uh, from down south named Holly Colley M. Murchison. And you could purchase her book and it's called Tell Me About Yourself. Uh, for some of the folks on the call, you would have um, done this session alongside of me. Holly and I then connected. I took her story lab. And then I really took that work that she does to deep dive into your own personal story. And I found a really great sticky uh, snack bite size way of, um, of really describing it so that I could use, use it in my work, but also help people understand where they're coming from. And what she does is that she kind of looks at four quadrants, like your values and beliefs, your skills and expertise, your passions, um, the things that you have a desire to do. And she really allows you to dive into your story. What I do is then take similar, take those four quadrants and then define who you are from the perspective of your lens and what your unconscious bias might be. So that's a lot of um, technicality, but at the end of the day, it's about telling your story and telling your story in such a way that people understand that you have a diverse lived experience. One thing that I know about the outdoor industry, and you know, this isn't a surprise to us on the call, and you know that I'm doing this as someone who has walked alongside of you in this industry, is that it is a very white industry. It is a very privileged industry and is a very elite industry. And beyond industry, when you think about access to backcountry skiing and the backcountry in general, it is a very elite sport. It's a very elite access uh, piece. And so more often than not, uh, there are a lot more white folks in that space than, than folks of color or folks with diverse lived experience. So what this exercise does is allows all of us, regardless of how we perceive our lived experience, is to recognize that we all have a lived experience and a diversity of thought. And the reason why this is very important, and this is me striving to ask you to be an allyship of me and people like me, is to recognize that you have race and that you have culture if you're a person that identifies as white. A lot of times um, white folks 
see other cultures and other races as, as people that have that and they don't. But what that does is actually create this situation. Robin DiAngelo speaks of this beautifully in white fragility from the white perspective, which I don't have, which is the, this feeling that if everyone else has race, if everyone else has culture, but I don't, this is her word, then that means that I'm the baseline and everyone else is different. Everyone else is other. And you can see how that perpetuates and has perpetuated in our society. So this exercise really allows you to see where you're coming from and allows you to focus on aspects of yourself that are under the umbrella of diversity and are under the umbrella of, of your own lived experience and figuring that out. Okay, that was a very long preamble about trying to tell you about who I am. So who am I? Uh, it's pretty evident, you can see me right away, that I'm a person of color. Um, previously, I, I said that I had rainbows shooting out of my eyes. I don't know if that's true anymore, but I'm a trans person of color. I, I hold my queer identity pretty close to my heart. Um, I'm a parent of both fur babies and human babies. In fact, you probably hear one of my fur babies clinking around right now. Uh, I'm a child of immigrants. Um, really, that immigration and that um, the, re the way that I got here to be in the world is through colonization. My gra grandparents um, met on the sugarcane fields in Fiji, and they wouldn't have been there if not for colonization. My grandmother was from Nepal, which is on the other side of the Himalayas. My grandfather was from Rajasthan, both in India. They would never have crossed the Himalayas to meet each other, and they met on the sugarcane fields after being um, taken from their home um, villages to these lands to be indentured laborers. And what that means is they were told that they would get a job and land and be able to go back home after making amount of money and, and that never happened. They were put on a ship and then they were put into this, on this island and that's where they live for the rest of their lives. Um, my biological father is um, native Fijian. So my parents would have never have met if not for the fact that she happened to be in Fiji even though she's of Indian descent. So my background is a quarter Nepalese, uh, half Indian and a uh, quarter Pacific Islander black uh, native Fijian. So I am essentially a product of colonization and I sit with that. You know, I'm smiling about it, but it's interesting because I feel like so many of us are a product of diaspora, of Indian diaspora or whatever diaspora they are experiencing in their world. And if you dig back into your own ancestry, you might realize that as well, regardless of the fact that no one might ask you where you're from as much as they ask me, but I invite you to think about that. The other thing that I identify with is as a friend and as a parent. I also identify as a settler because this is not my native land. Um, my native land is both in Fiji and uh, in India. Uh, I'm a bridge builder because I can see opportunities of connection between groups, regardless of whether those groups see eye to eye in that moment. This exercise is one way of making those connections, recognizing that we're all diverse and we all have a perspective and a way of connecting with others. Um, and I'm a lifelong learner. I know that learning isn't done. Simply because I'm queer doesn't mean that I'm queer competent. Simply because I'm a person of color does not mean that I know the perspective of all folks of color. And finally, the last three things you need to know about me are that I'll always choose coffee over tea, except my mom's chai. Uh, if you've ever felt or heard the wrath of an Indian mother, you know that's a good thing. Uh, I will uh, always pick bread baking over bread winning and trails over streets, which I'm sure a lot of us on the call can appreciate. So that's a little bit about me and a little bit about the lens and why I think it's important. Um, I went a bit deeper into this than I normally do in sessions because I think that this is really important for you to know where I'm coming from, where the reason why I wake up every morning in the same way I know that Dave wakes up every morning to solve climate change, I wake up every morning to ensure that the world is better for all of us, regardless of who we are. Okay, so now we're going to get a bit interactive. I've done a lot of talking and I would love you to do um, some interacting now. So Izzy is going to help me. She's going to put you into breakout groups and I would love to pair you up. There might be, I'm not sure if there's an odd number um, at the moment, so there might be one uh, a group that has three, but essentially you're going to pair up and you're going to tell me about someone you love. 
And for the folks that are here from MEC, you've done this before with me, just do it again. Uh, but essentially the group, the way this is gonna go, Izzy, maybe don't um, put people into breakout rooms until I finish, uh, is that you're going to uh, tell the person that you're in the room with about someone you love, just like it says here, but you are going to use gender neutral pronouns when you do it. So that means that you're, you can use a person's name, that's a bit of a crutch, but I invite you not to. Uh, it could be, and I recognize it's going to feel uncomfortable because that may not be the pronoun that they use. Um, and if you know someone who uses they, them pronouns, think of someone else. Uh, don't talk about me, for example. Uh, so if you could tell, tell your, your partner in your breakout group about someone you love using gender neutral pronouns. And what does that mean? A gender neutral pronoun would be using they, them, like I use, you could use these, their. Um, as well is um, is a popular one. They them tends to be tends to be the one that we use the most in our area of the world in North America. Most of us are North American, um, so you can just start there. Do folks kind of understand what I mean? Uh, pop in the chat if you have any questions. Any questions, Izzy? No, sounds good. Um, okay, so I will send everyone out in breakout rooms. Emil, I don't know if you will be end up in one. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, you can just tell me when to bring people back. Yep, it's, I'm going to give you about um, three minutes and then the breakout room itself will give you a 60 second countdown. So we have about four minutes to do this, two minutes each. Okay, the, the minimum it's letting me do is three people per room. Is that okay? Sounds great. Okay. Let's do it. Okay. So I'll give you five minutes. Okay, um, it's telling me to go into breakout room 15, but if there's two people there already, I just won't go. There are two people there already, yeah. Okay. Oh, good. I'm seeing breakout rooms now. It's popped up for me. So okay, so. Um, if I do want to do it again, I can, but I'll let folks. Um, I don't think I'll do it again anyway. There's okay. a few folks that are still joining, I think, that haven't joined the breakout rooms yet. Yeah, it looks like that. Mm. Nice to see you in person. Yeah, yeah, this is great. Zoom. Um, Really happy to be doing this session. Thank you. Hi, Dave. Nice to see you. Nice to see you too. Thanks for doing this. And sorry that I was uh, I I'm doing the next session and and uh, and interviewing someone. So I'm just kind of prepping, but I'm listening uh, as you go here. Did you yeah, for sure? Did you get called to a breakout room, Dave? Or I I did, but I rejected okay. it. Oh, you rejected. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> And yeah, and if there's folks that are like multitasking, they might not have like seen it, but at least yeah. everyone at least has a partner. Yeah, I believe. Yeah, yeah, everyone's got at least two to three people in. Hey, Emil, so have you transitioned away from Mac? Is that you're doing? Yeah, this that, yeah I did that sometime in August. Um, MEC was planning on bringing me back as a consultant. Um, but I think with the transition now, I, when the dust settles, I'll see what happens. Um, uh, but I have been working with um, uh, quite a few different clients since um, the pandemic really hit. Oh, great. Mm -hmm. Good. I'm, I'm glad to hear that. See, it, yeah. it, it, you said it's something that you're passionate about. So that's, that's nice that you can follow that. Yeah, what I found, you know, I'm sure you found this when you were working in the fields that you were previously. What I would join an organization and I would be like, I could do d &I on the side if you want me to. Like, I, you know, just like I'm sure in any like business meeting, you're like, so climate change, you know, let's mm -hmm. talk about it. It was like that in all of my jobs. And I would just like do the work without asking for a title and then do it side of desk. And I did that for 12 years um, and then like sat on boards and did education on the side and led organizations that were from like uh, for equity seeking groups. And then finally, I was like, if I love this so much, I should just do it. Good for you. Yeah. Good for you. Yeah. Amazing. The pandemic kind of kicked me out the door. <laughs> and you're in Vancouver? 
I am for now. I literally, so what you don't see is all these moving boxes. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. So that's why I've got, this is the only wall that is safe right now. Right. <laughs> uh, the moving truck comes on Sunday. We're moving to Powell River. Oh, cool. Mm -hmm. Which is on the Sunshine Coast here, Dave. I'm not sure if you have yeah, been. It's, it's kind of like a, it feels like a lot of people are moving, like it's a great community for families and housing is not go crazy yet supposedly and the outdoors like yeah really ancient it. like first growth mm -hmm. rainforest granite walls ocean 32 lakes that you can portage through amazing yeah yeah it's cool it's quite a, okay let's bring people back okay um close all of it okay they've been yeah the kids the kids and the animals are going to be in nature every single day how old are your kids uh three wait sorry two and a half years old and three months Ugh. oh my gosh whoa you're busy that took you way too long to answer that <laughs> <laughs> well i was trying to do like three months and two and i don't know why i yeah. want eleanor to go first so. yeah my brain cool all right welcome back folks are you starting to come back here let's see yeah they're starting to slowly come back i think the breakout room gives them like a 60 second countdown yeah, it says they have 22 seconds left. Cool. And whereabouts are you located, Izzy? Uh, in Revelstoke. Okay, cool. Yeah, also in nature's yeah. Uh, yeah, playground. Totally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we both have our little view of our window here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm hiding, hiding kids' toys scattered around my house, too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so folks are coming back. That's great. Um, popcorn style as people are coming back. Uh, let me know, like, what was that like for you? I will hear from, let's say, two or three people. I've, I've never had a conversation in such context that it was totally interesting and, and not that hard, ultimately. Mm -hmm. But being in France right now, trying to learn a new language, it was a little bit like that, like your brain is spinning, trying to get out what you want. So. It was a good exercise yeah. thing. Yeah, no worries. Sometimes like your brain does like take a minute to actually like not computing, you know? And then, you know, great point to bring up different languages even, even though that wasn't um, your, your initial point, but in Spanish, French, and in a lot of different languages, um, you know, the most inanimate objects are gendered. So it's, a, it's an interesting thing to even consider when you're thinking about being multilingual. It would be way easier to learn lots of those languages if everything was the yeah. neutral. Yeah, exactly. Uh, uh, anyone uh, else? Yeah, Emil, actually, that was a question I've been wondering about. Are countries that do have gendered objects, um, how are, or is, this, is this something that's like happening in the English language? Is it happening in other languages, presumably, as well? How is that happening in those countries? Yeah, so... Great question. So the fact of a gender neutral pronoun is definitely happening all over the world. Uh, there are a lot of um, queer serving organizations in different countries that are either defining new terms or looking at um, terms that would be for a large group of people uh, that as like ways of describing, just like we do, they being, um, being usually in plural form, but now the singular they is, has been recognized by our own like standards of language. So in the same way, other languages are doing the same. As far as revolutionizing how people even, how, lang how other countries deem inanimate objects, that would be really cool. And I don't know when that's gonna happen. Like, why is the table a female? Like, I don't understand. Like, for me, that's really interesting, but um, it's, it's wild. But language itself, as much as we think that that will never happen, language is so fluid and constantly changing. And I swore I have to like go to my, I used to be the director of our local queer organization here in British Columbia. I have to go drop into their, like use a drop in once in a while just to make sure that I know what the newest language pieces are because <laughs> it is it's changing uh, extremely quickly. Thanks for sharing. Um, Amel, a quick question. So mm -hmm. where do you think hey, you see? Oh, hi. <laughs> Um, good to see you, by the way. I'm, uh, I've been missing you. I was in Vancouver and I wanted to um, actually uh, drop by and, and, and see you, but I was only there for half a day, so I 
unfortunately couldn't make that stay last. But let's, uh, so my question for you, Amil, is, uh, you know, where do you see language changing in the next five years? Where do you think, um, uh, how do you think we'll be communicating? Um, well, I can't speak to how we'll be communicating for, because it's not, I wouldn't say I'm a language expert, but as far as my personal opinion, if you look at five years ago, you'll see, you see how much language has shifted and changed. Um, then you go 10 years and you see how much language shifted and changed. Um, previously, the pound button was the pound button. Now we know it as hashtag, right? Like it is, that was just a button on our phone that we would use, um, you know, like, I don't know, I would do pound 411 to find out where my local pizza shop was, you know, so this is language itself is changing at an extremely rapid rate. I did not think that the singular they would be recognized by, you know, the Oxford Dictionary. It was actually deemed the, the word of the year in 2019 um, by, by linguists um, because it was so influential of changing the trends of language. So I do feel that, you know, in the same way of even the acronyms of POC, BIPOC, uh, indigeneity, all these words that are, have been created by community and acronyms um, are going to um, influence um, how we perceive the world. In the same way as climate, like this is a climate focused summit, um, I think that language is extremely powerful um, and it is a way of, of enacting change. And so I think the next five years, we're going to see even more movement um, on all different systems. And I'll actually get into systems soon so that you can recognize that none of these things happen in silo, that all of these things are interconnected, whether it's language, politics, education, um, you know, uh, and healthcare reform, all these things are inter interconnected. Um, someone asked what the name of the book was that I mentioned. Robin D'Angelo is um, a professor. She's uh, a white woman and she's from Seattle and she has a really great TED talk. You can look up on YouTube videos, look her up. She actually talks like for hours on white fragility, which is her book. Uh, I've, I've heard her speak. She's a fantastic speaker um, because I do feel like she can connect with people in a way that I can't, which is uh, from the white perspective. But thanks for that question, Mario. Appreciate it. Um, so I'm going to start sharing my screen again because I do want us to be able to um, then get into some exercises so I can leave you with some tangible work um, and tangible things to start um, working on. Where is my... Cute fur baby. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Uh, where's my pal session? I'm going to stop sharing screen until I find it again. Thanks for your patient, y'all. Patience. I think I had it in full screen, so I'm just trying to find it again. All right, here it is. I'll pop you all up here. This would be a convenient time for my um, internet to start cycling. Um, so we have talked about how this journey starts with you. You've, you've you know, learned a little bit about who I am. Um, now I think you know, we need to take that reflection back to you. I think at the end of the day, we need to recognize that the biggest influence we have on creating change is with ourselves and with the people that are around us. So this exercise that I do, um, when I do a full day session or a half day session with folks, we dive into it a bit deeper. We talk about, you know, quadrants of privilege. But what I'm gonna do with you right now is a quick exercise so that you can leave here today with some ways of creating tangible change. Um, and so really what we're gonna talk about now is your circle of trust and how you can actually shift your influence into allyship. So what do I mean by a circle of trust? Um, as you saw with my fur baby, I think the people that are in my circle of trust either are two-legged or four-legged. My circle of trust includes like my core people um, and then everyone else is out there. And I think a lot of us, you know, feel the same way. Uh, and so if you have those papers that um, I provided, I would bring that out now. If not, you may not have it in paper form. Uh, just bring out a piece of paper and I will walk you through this exercise. 
The reason why understanding why systems are important uh, when we talked about, you know, climate change and climate action is the fact that, as I mentioned when I was chatting with Mario, well, based on his question, is that nothing happens in silo. We need to start looking at development and change from a systems perspective. And I'm sure that Dave and, and the folks that protect our winters that you're, you're involved with see this as well, that when we're going to change how society perceives um, anything is that we need to change all the systems at once. You might have once seen, you know, in the 1950s, this discussion around the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which is a triangle, a pyramid. Unfortunately, that pyramid really serves only one group um, because that pyramid starts with the bottom of, you know, your basic needs, which are shelter, food, um, and then you go into a sense of belonging. So that would be uh, being able to make connections and then a sense of esteem and then eventually a place called self-actualization or as I would perceive that from my um, cultural background as nirvana. But because it's a hierarchy, because it's a pyramid, it's basically saying that you need one thing before you achieve another, before you achieve another to get to that point. And then you think about folks that are, um, that have a lot of barriers. When I think about me when I was a child, I was struggling with homelessness with my family. Um, we weren't, we were, you know, we had food security issues, but does that mean that I wasn't allowed to have a sense of esteem or connection? No, it doesn't mean that someone who's struggling with housing is never going to reach actualization, but that is how that pyramid was set up. So when you think about that pyramid is, was utilized in creating a lot of our systems. And when you think about the folks that can reach that self-actualization, that is going to tend to be um, the people who created the systems. And more often than not, those are white men. So that is really set up for people that have the privilege of, you know, having a safe home, having stable income, having the ability to then focus on, you know, creating their sense of belonging in the, in the way that they perceive it to be important, and then reaching that place of self-actualization. So there were other theories of systems. My background is in human development and psychology. And Brothenburner, um, he was uh, a, German, a German guy. Um, Mario, uh, shout out to your background there. Uh, and Brothenburner uh, was a psychologist and a sociologist, and he actually created an ecological framework that was um, looking at micro, meso, exo, and macro systems. I'm not going to do a sociology lecture here. The biggest thing that you need to recognize is that what Brothenburner said and how I've adopted this system, or this framework, is that each individual interacts with systems around them. And when you think about, you know, the fact that you are human in this circle, around you are your, your family members, your circle of trust. Around that is, you know, the areas of your neighborhood. So your local school, your community center, your healthcare, your, your local politics, government. And then around that is culture and institutions and how they interact in creating that sense of culture and social norms. So when we think about the fact that, you know, as, as Dave said, when you think that you can't impact the world as one person, you realize that you're interacting with these systems on a daily basis. Therefore, you're both um, implicit in the way that they're created and the way that they are exist in the world, but you also have a way of influencing change in those systems. It also tells us that in order for anything to change, we need to change our systems. When we think about systems of oppression, this is my interpretation of that. These systems are created to continue to oppress the oppressed but we can shift this and see them as systems of change because my way of seeing the world is through a positive and, and an appreciative inquiry framework, which essentially means how do you take something that's bad and negative and find a solution to make it positive and make it work for people. So we're going to actually take this huge system and we're going to really drill down to that inner circle, which is you, because at the end of the day, what did I say? It starts with you. So let's do it. All right. So you have a piece of paper in front of you. I would like you, if you don't have that um, diagram or the, the handout, I just want you, it's very simple, just draw a circle. Um, don't take up the whole piece of paper, maybe just take up half of the paper with that circle. And in that, I want you to write four to six people that are in your circle of trust. Please go outside of your um, air quotes biological family here. Um, maybe you can choose chosen family for sure, but these are people that are in your circle of trust. These are your, your besties, the people that are in your inner network, the folks that you reach out to when you've had a good or bad day. 
um, you know, before you make a big decision, like you're marrying someone or buying a puppy, these are the people that you reach out to. Four to six. For the purpose of this exercise, it might be hard if one of them is a dog, even though Peanut would be in my circle of trust, um, but try not to. Try to think of human forms. Okay. I'm looking around here, people still looking down. How are we doing? Yeah, a lot of you are still looking down. Okay, you got one more minute here. Okay, cool. Now flip that paper over, please. Uh oh, come back. And on the other side of the paper, I want you to to have a, an X axis and a Y axis. I'm gonna stop sharing here actually. I'm giving away the, giving everything away. <laughs> so on the top of the Y axis, um, sorry, I shouldn't talk in like research. Here, on the, the top of the page, if you could write those four to six people in like columns, essentially. So it's like, for me, it would be like Kate, my partner, and then James, and then Mario, and then Izzy, you know, like folk, like names of people that are in my inner circle. Okay. And then on the, on the rows below, I want you to write the words that I'm saying, okay? Uh, you might, if you have already, you know, done this or seen this exercise, you already know what I'm gonna say here. But essentially what I want you to write is gender as the first. There's gonna be about six of them, um, six, maybe eight, gender. So remember this is in relation to you. If the people in on that table have the same gender as you, I want you to have a check mark underneath their name. And this could be gender identity. Um, it could be how you perceive gender to be. In the context of heteronormativity, is that if you're a man, if they're a man, you put a check mark. If you're trans, if they're trans, you put a check mark. Okay? Remember, it's in relation to you. Below that, sexuality. So if they have the same sexuality as you, this is your circle of trust. I hope you know this. If you don't, we need to have some deeper conversations. All right, so if you are, um, and not, not judging you, you don't have to have deep conversations if you don't want to, but if you are someone it, who identifies as heterosexual um, and your people in your circle of trust do, um, you, you just write their names. But maybe if one doesn't, you do not put a check mark underneath their name. Okay, so we've got gender and sexuality. And again, if they have the same gender or sexuality as you, you put a check mark underneath their name. So you should have like two check marks if they have the same gender and sexuality as you under someone, um, under your first person, for example. Okay, I'm over explaining. Race, if that, write down race, and then if the people in your circle of trust have the same race as you, a racial background, put a check mark under their name. Language, if the people in your circle of trust speak the same language as you and have, yeah, let's say currently speak the same language as you. I recognize that this might be like if someone has a different mother tongue, don't worry about that right now. If they currently speak the same language as you, put a check mark under their name. Okay, the next one is place of origin. So write down place of origin and then beside underneath their names if they have the same place of origin as you put a check mark underneath place of origin is where they were born um, their ancestral background um, so if you were born in canada and you know that they were if you don't know don't worry about it this is an 80 20 rule like you don't have to be perfect about it 
if you think that they're born in the same place as you, not the same city, the same, let's say, country. Okay, next is ability. So if they have the same level of ability as you, which means I'm an able-bodied person, if Kate, um, who my partner, she's also able-bodied, I would put a check mark under her name. If I have a friend who um, is a person with a disability, whether it be invisible or visible, I would not put a check mark underneath their name. Okay, the next is status. Now this one, it might be a bit harder to decipher, so I'm gonna explain this a bit more. What I mean by that, this is like a class or social economic status. If in your life, people in your circle of trust, if you are a person that has um, a sense of stability in your life and um, you know, you're not precariously housed, uh, you have um, steady income or income in a way that's like uh, achieving your goals and the people in your circle of trust also do, then they would get a check mark. If one of them is like in a place where it's a little bit, you know, more unstable for them, then maybe don't put a check mark in comparison to you. Okay, and the last one is age. And we're going to think about age as cohorts here. So we're going to go a five year age range. So if the people are within a five-year age range as you, so I'm 40, and it's hard to imagine, I can't believe I turned 40, I would be looking at 35 to 45 year olds. And if these folks are within that age range, I would put a check mark under their name. Okay, so this is usually a really amazing time of uh, retrospection um, and reckoning at the same time. I'm not gonna try to soften the blow here. A lot of times with the folks that I work with, the reason why they're bringing in someone like me is that there's a recognition of a level, level of um, homogenousness. I don't know if there's a word for that but it, there's a recognition that something needs to shift. There's a tension there. If you're looking at your table and you see a lot of check marks, don't be surprised, but have a moment of introspection. Remember, you're not gonna share this with anyone. This is all about you. You're gonna take this, you're gonna have some homework um, that I'm gonna provide you in a minute here, but this is such a great moment for you to recognize where you have that level of, of sameness. It might be in a specific quadrant, uh, whether it was around gender or race or ability, or it might be all over the map. So take a moment here to think about that. Take a moment to think about where you have that homogenousness and where you have potential opportunity. Remember how I said that my perspective and the way I do this work is where I see something where there's a sense of tension, I, I lean into that tension and I find the opportunity and that ability and the invitation for growth. So for me, I fully recognize that I surround myself with able-bodied people. And I really sit with that because, you know, I could think about that from the perspective of that I'm very active, I love to do things, but it's a weird assumption that someone that had a different ability wouldn't be able to do that. And how have I created my life to only surround myself with these types of folks, which means that I'm perpetuating this weird bias I have around folks um, with diverse abilities. So I've recently reached out to someone and I'm working alongside of them to figure out, you know, to kind of uncover and unpack my own pieces. Her name is Karen Lai. She's in a really amazing accessibility uh, consultant. If anyone is, is thinking about doing that, um, it's Karen, last name L-A-I, uh, consulting. Uh, and so she's fantastic. She goes on so many different excursions and she's someone that uses two, two canes uh, to walk. So I think, um, I think it's really important to think about, you know, our, our worlds and the kind of vacuums that we live in. I know it is homogeneity. It's true. Someone just like said it to me. 
Thank you, Scott. I appreciate it. Uh, I didn't know if I could say that. It seemed like it too many syllables for me, to be honest. Um, it's a great moment of reflection for everyone to think about who's in their circle. And uh, this is going to be the opportunity now to see if we can start shifting it. So go back, go back to that first page. Maybe you already know what I'm going to do here. And if you do, kudos. And for the folks that didn't have a lot of check marks, okay, this work is going to be even more transformative for you, I think. So we're going to go back to that circle of influence. And I want you to think about who you could put in that circle of inference or what or where, okay? Because I'm talking about news channels. I'm talking about social Instagram accounts. I'm talking about content. I'm talking about books and writers and films and documentaries. Those are all things that you can plot into your circle of influence. And if you're looking at me and going like, Emil, I have no idea where to start. Don't worry about it. I will send you a resource guide. It's a bit of a cheat sheet. Remember that it's a moment of time where I've pulled some resources um, and they're vetted for this exact moment because I, you don't know what's going to happen in three to six months. I don't know if folks from um, the Netflix series of Love on the Spectrum are going to come back and say this isn't a true depiction of people with autism. So for now, those are the resources that I'm providing you, um, but please continue to go outside of those resources um, and start following different people on Instagram. Start, you know, subscribing to different news channels, start listening to different kinds of music, absorbing different kinds of content and culture, because that is going to shift your perspective. It's going to be wild that you will start realizing that you're exposing yourself to different ways of being. Um, I'm sure that the folks at POW also recommend this for people when they're constantly getting the same messages around climate change and climate action. The moment you start subscribing to different news, you recognize why someone might have a different perspective than you and find those, those moments of interconnection. In the same way, I want you to do that around diversity, equity, and inclusion. And specifically, look at the places where you have lots of check marks. But in other places, if you just haven't, you know, dove into a different uh, sphere of influence, then do that too. And you're going to think that that's where I want you to stop, but that's not true. I want you, do you remember going back to Broffenburner's system of change? There's this really wonderful, beautiful nucleus in between the micro and macro system. And that nucleus is a nucleus of change because the arrows go both ways. They go in and out, which means that we can influence ourselves as well as systems and as well as people. So I want you to take that influence and that change that you're feeling and who do I want you to change? the people in your circle of trust, okay? I want you to start bringing these things up at the dinner table, during happy hour, at brunch, over a beer. I want you to, to make that commitment to not only change yourself, but to change the people in your circle of trust. Because just like I said with systems, we need to change as many people, as many hearts, as many minds. You can transpose this to any social issue that you're thinking about. For me, it's around making the world an equitable place for all of us, which also includes climate action. It also includes education reform. It includes the, you know, dismantling of our current, you know, systems of authority and how they're, they're utilized. It's everything. And I want you to think about this as systems as well. I want you to increase your circle of influence, and then I want you to shift that influence into allyship and really come come to the table with that circle of trust and have you change for them and have them change for you and have you all change alongside of each other. So that's going to be your homework. You're going to fill in that circle of influence and then you're going to make a commitment to change yourself and then reflect that learning and that changing back to that circle of trust. I'm going to open the floor up for some, some questions here because that is a lot of content that I've provided and I want to hear your thoughts. I want to hear your thoughts on that. Hey, Mel, this is Greg. Um, I mean, I knew that I was going to have tick marks in all the same boxes because of my life, my homogeneous uh, lifestyle. But um, I, I don't know. It's, I agree. We need to step out of our comfort zones. But I also, like, I see my chickens, and they all segregate into their little groups. I've only got five, and they're, like, in their two little groups. They're different species, 
And even on their little level of chickenness, there's only five of them. And there's the two that are different and the three that are different. And it's really interesting to see that at that level, they even stick with their own comfort. And, and because we're more advanced, we should open ourselves up to more influence, exactly like you're saying. But it's interesting to see it at that base level of chickens that, you know, you, you're more comfortable with what looks like you and sounds like you. Totally. You know, I think the, the key word that I'm going to pull from, out from what you said is safe right like yeah. they feel safe they feel safe and i think that that is like such a cool recognition of like whoa this feels safe the sameness feels safe i kind of know where they came from they know they have the same family structure as me potentially they grew up in a similar neighborhood in a way of being they like the same things it feels safe and safe feels good as well right but That's you know safe doesn't always enact change and in the same way that you all have signed up to create change in the world, you can't create change in a silo. Because at the end of the day, the people that are most affected by climate action, by the droughts, by the fires, by the flo floods, are people that have been pushed to the fact of living right on the water's edge and not the good water, you know, that are living out near where all the tinder and the firewood is. They're living out on reserves where they don't have access to healthcare access to firefighters, access to private equity like we do. So those two things are absolutely interconnected. And that's me only looking at two systems. You know, I'm not talking about education. I'm not talking about healthcare. I'm not talking about prison reform. I'm just talking about climate action and diversity, equity, and inclusion. So absolutely, it would be safe to stay in your flock of chickens. But we also know that if you do that, you're going to stay in the same pen and you're gonna stay eating the same food and you're yeah. gonna have the same behavior. And the whole purpose of this work is to transform behavior in order to enact change, in order to make the world better and safer for all of us. Perfect, well said. I had a, had a question. Oh, sorry, Mario, do you wanna go? Oh, no, go ahead, I'll go after you. Okay, is that, my, is that my microphone that's acting up like that? It's like a robot yeah. that was Hi, here really. for a second. Nice hey, hey Emil, nice to meet you. Um, so uh, I, we just, in my family, we just had a, a really big transition. Uh, my dad is actually transitioned genders. Um, so uh, they, she, we, uh, she's a transgender female. So anyways, it's a big deal in our family. Um, and something that I've noticed personally, and I've actually done this in the hot, cool planet, or hot, planet cool athletes presentations and I really want to change my lingo is I keep on saying you guys hey you guys we're super stoked to be here and I really would love like a different phrase to change that because when I'm standing with my dad my dad is not a guy and um you know I really want to address that and I guess if, is there any like hey folks or anything else that you can come up mm -hmm. with as an alternative for sure Haley first I want to honor the fact that you shared that thank you so much as a trans person, uh, I would be so stoked when my kid stands up for me in a public way like that. Uh, so I just want to honor that and thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, and, uh, and there are so many options. In fact, I'm sure folks here know about many of them. Uh, there's a, actually, you know what, I'll add something to my resource guide. A really good friend of mine, Tony Latour, and my best friend, James Kelly, who's a trans man, came together and created these little cards called Hello There. And we would passively, passively, aggressively leave them on, uh, on tables at, at uh, restaurants because inevitably there would always be the server that would say, hey, ladies, hey, guys, hey, gents, and gender the whole conversation. So that was our way of just kind of like paying it forward about different use of language. And so they came up with a bunch of, bunch of it. Some of them are more fun than others. Like folks is a really great one. You notice that I use folks a lot. I use friends a lot because I love to bring people on. Like as far as like we're doing this together, um, as far as like this group, I would, I would call you all friends. Uh, you could say hello there when you're meeting someone. You could just say hello. Uh, you can also say um, y'all if that if feels okay for you. Like hey y'all. Like it may not be good as, as comfortable for me uh, because it's not necessarily – I'm just starting to get into my love of country music. Uh, so it may not come as smooth for me, but it, hey y'all, hey all, hey folks, hey friends, um, hey there, if you're talking about one person or, you know, I think there's a lot of different ones and I'm not trying to simplify it because I know this is like reworking the way we do things. 
the moment that people find out that it's going to be something that is feels like crappy for someone else, they're going to make that change. And you have this from a very personal perspective. Another thing that I could tell you, recognizing I've got five minutes left, is that if we all knew that the term rule of thumb, and you know, the folks here from MEC know that I would go around reminding people this all the time, was um, a rule back in the day of the thickness of the stick that you could beat your wife with. That's what a rule of thumb is. Would we continue to use that term of phrase? Probably not, right? Probably not. So I think that the moment we recognize the origin and not getting so tight as far as like, oh gosh, I need to think about everything I say. And if I say something, I'm gonna hurt someone. It's not about that. It's about like in real time learning of that moment of, okay, you know what? Language is like really hard as like Mario mentioned, it's constantly changing. It needs to, it's going to change at a rapid rate. There just might be a moment where you realize you've been saying something for a while, like let's powwow about this and recognize that maybe it's not a really great thing to say because it comes from indigenous culture. Then you're gonna have that moment of, okay, I need to unlearn and relearn a new way of being. And it comes from a place of, for me, not a place of judgment, but a place of curiosity. So when those moments happen, lean into that curiosity, have some wonder and curiosity about what, what it's about and recognize that and have be gentle with yourself because it's going to take a minute to unlearn. But there's a lot of really great resources out there. And I'll add the hello there to your resource guide. Thanks for that, Haley. I also wanted to done it. I appreciate it. Um, I am going to have to move on just because um, we only have about four minutes left. And I want to really honor your time because I know that you all have um, a lot of like, oh, I just said it. Look at that. Uh, you all have a lot of, oh, I did it again. Okay, I need to move. I'm actually distracting myself now. Uh, you have a lot of really interesting things that you, you need to work through today. So I just wanna leave you with a moment of reflection. And for folks that have done sessions with me before, you'll recognize this moment of reflection, but I want you to go with it because I think it's always a, a fantastic reminder. Um, because when we think about what privilege is, a lot of times people think that it's this really complex system. And I do actually have quadrants of privilege that I go through with folks. But for me, for today, what we're going to do is have, we're going to end the session with a moment of reflection. And I want you to listen to my voice and listen to the statements that I'm making. And I want you to really sit with those statements and see how they resonate with you. You might recognize and, uh, those statements as things that you have experienced in your life. You might have a moment where you haven't experienced those things in your life. I just want you to sit with it and reflect. So if you feel good, I would love for you to close your eyes. If not, a soft gaze to the floor is just fine. I just need you to get to a place of contemplation and reflection, and that's how we're gonna end the session. I'll give you a moment to sort yourself out. So a soft gaze to the floor or your eyes closed if that feels safe for you right now. So I'm gonna read these statements. I'll leave a short pause in between, and at the end, I'll bring you back. I can talk about my partner without worrying it will affect my colleagues attitudes towards me. I often see fair, positive and nuanced depictions of people like me in the media. I can travel to other countries without worrying about personal risk. My partner and I can be affectionate in public without fearing for our safety. If I choose to raise children, I can become confident of the general support for my community. I know where my next meal is coming from. When I go out, I know I can find a washroom that I'm comfortable and feel safe using. I have always known that there are people in the world like me.
I can move about my community without the fear of harm, persecution, mistrust, assistance, or ridicule. I can use my name without having to explain it or change it to make it easier for others. I can vote. I can access healthcare easily and without stress or worry. I'm able to engage in conversation easily and have someone understand me without extra support. I have a safe place to sleep. I have the love and care of people around me. Okay, come back. So that is privilege. You know, if a lot of those statements were reflections of your own life, that's privilege. But that is also gratitude. There's a lot of gratitude that we can have to have these experiences in our world. And there's a lot of gratitude that we can then share with empathy of recognizing how important it would be for everyone to have those experiences. For those of you that heard statements or that didn't reflect your experience, I hear you, I see you, I know. And for those of us that it did, this is your invitation to create change so all of us can have that. So be grateful, but also change yourself, change your circle of trust, and as I always say in my session, change the world. It starts with you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emil. That was amazing. Um, I feel like we could talk to you for days and there, there's so much to go through here, but thank you so much. And hopefully we can do another session with you again soon. Awesome. Thanks so much, everybody. Have a lovely rest of your day. Feel free to connect with me. All good. See ya. Thank you for your time. Great, everyone. So um, <clears throat> we're going to have a quick break. Um, we have 13 minutes. So we're starting with Naomi, um, Harvard History of Science professor at 11 a.m. PST. Um, so that's in, yeah, that's in 12 minutes. So go quickly, go pee, grab some water, do some jumping jacks. I'm going to share my screen here because I have a little, it's a body break. Um, so yeah, we will, uh, <laughs> we'll see you soon. You can turn off your camera and mute yourself if you want. And yeah, just try to be back right on for 11 because we will start rolling then. Thanks. Thanks, Susie. Thank you. you, Emil. Thanks so much. Yeah. Thanks, Dave. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. If folks want to reach out, they can reach out to Steph and the Corker Collective. Awesome. You're awesome. Thanks yeah. All right. That was amazing. Thanks, was really awesome. yeah. Anytime. If I can help pound anyway, just let me know. Great. I represent. <laughs> Love it. See ya. <clears throat>
Hi, Naomi. How's that? Hey, there we go. Good. How are you? I'm good. How's it going? Ah, uh, things are going really well. Thanks. Yeah, I think we've had we've been hovering around 50 to 60 people based on the the different sessions that we've had this morning, and uh, so far so good. Great. Great. Yeah. How's your day? Yeah, good. It's um, yeah, it's just too much going on, <laughs> but it's Friday, so uh, <laughs> after this, I think I'm gonna call it a day and maybe go to Walden Pond. So yeah, it's okay. <laughs> yeah, that sounds nice. Yeah. Yeah, we really appreciate you doing this. No um, worries. So, so everybody's kind of on a uh, on a ten minute little break here. Uh, okay. Actually, they can probably hear us. Uh, <laughs> convert oh, okay. us. Uh, just so you know, we we don't have any elite plan with Zoom. It's it's very basic. So we're we're mm -hmm. in the meeting right now, and uh, at two o'clock, I'll I'll just kind of start with with what we had looked at together and. Um, maybe check in to see how things are going there weather wise and stuff like that but then we'll just sure. jump right into it and hopefully at the end we'll have a few minutes for some question and answer and and so far people have been really lively with uh with that so okay okay i'm happy to be flexible and where in canada are you i'm in waterloo ontario ah, okay uh in so in canada pow is based out of the university of waterloo Oh, okay. I didn't know that. Or maybe I did not I forgot. Oh, that's great. You actually know people there. Do you know anyone in the hydrology program there? Um, not <laughs> new names. Are you able to? Yeah. John Cherry. Do you know, have you ever come across John? No. John he's, Cherry. A, he's, he's actually a great guy. He, he, um, he and I served on a big panel a few years ago on fracking in Canada. And, uh, he was actually heroic in trying to actually have us write a real report that actually said something and not just, oh, let's just do more research. <laughs> oh, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. He's a great guy. If you ever need somebody, you know, if you ever need a scientist to help out, uh, especially if it's anything to do with water resources, uh, he's a terrific person. Yeah. It, I, I mean, we've been very fortunate to, to have connected into there. One of our board members uh, is Dan Scott. And Dan is the executive director of the Institute for Climate Change at the University of Waterloo. Great. Um, and, and Waterloo has a pretty, like in, in Canada anyways, it's one of the leading um, climate institutes. So we're, we're really lucky to have Dan. And, and he's the one that's done a number of, I, I'm sure you've seen it because he's done stuff for, for POW US in the past too. But um, he tends to really uh, put a lot out around the Olympics and, mm. and, and what places that have hosted the Olympics in the last uh, 30 years are going to be able to host it in the next 30 years, that type of stuff. Yeah, I have seen that. Yeah, and it's very sad. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, yeah, it's very yeah. sad too because I, um, I was in the Lake Placid area this summer and just thinking about that, I guess people around Lake Placid are hoping they could bring the Olympics back there again sometime, but yeah, I don't oh. know if that's realistic. Wow. Yeah, I don't pay enough attention to what um, you, you know outside of outside of my little region and and those that we activate in here in Canada. But I, I don't really know what the reality is down there. I, I do do a trip once a year down to um, New Hampshire to, to Tuckerman's Ravine and oh know, yeah, kind of uh -huh. play in there. But beyond that, I, I don't know what what's happening at Lake Placid. What the weather's been like? What the winters have been like? Well, I think it's like a lot of places. It's just not consistent anymore right yeah. there was a time when you could count on tons of snow and cold weather and now maybe maybe some years yes some years no yeah so you do you ski the ravine tuckerman i do yeah uh, nice nice it, it, my it, 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 oh sorry go ahead go ahead oh i said my brother-in-law brad ray was the ranger there from for a long time for like 25 years and um, actually had a series of dogs, German Shepherd dogs that he trained to do snow rescue, all of whom were named Tuckerman. Um, and when my own daughter graduated from college, the thing she decided to do to celebrate graduating from Bowdoin College was to ski the ravine. And I have to say, I'm not like normally a nervous mom, but I, I just, I mean, my brother-in-law has carried bodies out of the ravine. So I felt a little nervous about it. And I said, just promise me one thing. And she said, what? Just call Uncle Brad 
get him to give you the snow report. He was retired by this time, but still paying attention. He said, if Uncle Brad says it's safe, then I'm fine with it. So they did. And actually my daughter said that the actual skiing was not that hard. It's just, there's, I guess there's a piece like where you have to kind of climb yeah. in over the top on the rocks. And she said that was a bit hair raising, but the, the actual skiing once you were in the ravine was, was actually pretty mellow. It sounds like, uh, like, we would be good ski partners because I, I'm the same way like that. Uh, I, I actually don't like the climbing piece. You know, mm. if there was a chairlift to get me to the top, I, I would be very happy. Uh, the skiing down is is not an issue, but but the going up, I just don't like that. Yeah, yeah. But if there was a lift, it wouldn't be the same because then it would be filled with people. <laughs> it's very true. Although it is insane there in the spring. Like, I mean, there's, there's really big lineups there in the spring of people. Um, kind of making this pilgrimage yeah no i know i know yeah so yeah well um i think we're, we're just going to give this a couple more minutes we have izzy on there um okay. i don't know if you can see izzy, but she's from our team in canada yep yep people just showed up yep hi izzy how are you hi great thank you thanks for being here you're welcome my pleasure i appreciate it izzy um is uh, her role is very similar to Jake Black's in the U.S. She mm -hmm. she runs our Hot Planet Cool Athlete program, well, all of our programs, and mm -hmm. um, and our athlete ambassador team. So mm -hmm. she has her hands full. Mm -hmm. And Dave, are you a professional athlete or almost professional? <laughs> no, I, I mean, I probably look like it, right? Uh, but uh, no, I'm not. That, that, that might be like you think that's an insult. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of his biggest dreams, actually. It's it's why he started POW, I think. It's just a, there you go. a professional You dress so bad, you must be a dirtboard snowboarder or something. <laughs> He's got your number, Dave. Pro by 50. What's that? Go pro by 50. You got 50. my number. Yeah. She's got your number. She figured you out right away. Well, yeah. she, it's funny, actually, that she says I'm dressing like a dirt bag because I'm actually wearing your sweater, Greg. This is your art. <laughs> <laughs> Point taken. Point taken. Well, you know, I it's fine. I do I do a lot of Zoom teaching and webinars and stuff. And I went to get dressed this morning. I thought, wait, this is POW, so it was easy to get dressed. <laughs> That's amazing. You look the part. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we, again, we'll just wait one more minute. Maybe the the way that we have it structured, Naomi, is that we've been we've invited like in a normal year, we would do this the same as POW US where, you know, we all get together and we have donors and partners and athletes together. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, this year, what we did for the Zoom session, the strategy was just to make it for ambassadors. Okay. But then um, we, we knew that we wanted to have partners uh, be able to join us for, for this conversation and for kind of another general update that we had this morning. So. Right now, we're just waiting to onboard a couple more partners, and then we'll be in. We'll okay. Be in. Yeah. Izzy, where are you located? I'm in Revelstoke, which is interior of British Columbia. Nice. Yeah. Small ski town. Nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we have snow on the peaks this morning, which is pretty crazy. So. Great. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. The weather is definitely never nice. Nice. We're starting to get autumn colors here. Oh, yeah. Yeah, same. It's just kind of starting down low. A few of the maple trees are turning. And yeah. Nice. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, um, Izzy, is it okay if we kind of... Uh, yeah, yeah let's, let's roll. Okay. <laughs> 